Uh, Ambassador Crocker, these are some extraordinary days both for Iran and for the countries involved in the negotiations over the nuclear issue of the Islamic Republic. Uh, all sides so far have expressed optimism that a deal might be within reach and they have extended the talks for another week. So what are the chances in your opinion that this round of negotiations would actually turn into a breakthrough that would solve the nuclear issue of Iran once and for all? We have a week to find out, um, and it's, there's not a lot of point now in, in speculating. I, I think several things are clear. Uh, first, the negotiations obviously have been very serious. Uh, there have been really no leaks that have uh, uh, come out of the negotiating room uh, in these recent weeks. I think that's a good sign. Uh, we all know what the main issues are. Uh, there are several, the two most important, uh, clearly are sanctions and sanctions relief for Iran and inspections, the terms and conditions for inspections uh, for the United States and, and its partners. Uh, uh, those have emerged as the two, I think, toughest issues for the negotiators to resolve. They've given themselves another week to do that and we'll just have to see. Uh, how realistic do you think to assume that a normalization of Iran-U.S. diplomatic relation would occur in near future if the nuclear deal is reached? I think if we do achieve a satisfactory nuclear agreement, a range of possibilities are, are going to emerge for, for all of us. I, I would not expect swift movement on diplomatic relations. There are any number of huge problems that would confront us all and it would have to be worked through. But an agreement would create uh, a different climate, uh, a different atmosphere in which diplomatic talks, uh, diplomatic relations, unthinkable before, would now become at least a possibility. But it'll take time. Well, you're talking about these changes which might be in part in favor of the uh, U.S.-Iran diplomatic relation. But on the other hand, in the region, there are some countries, Arab countries, mainly U.S. allies, who are not that much happy with what's going on between Iran and United States in particular. Saudi Arabia might be the most outspoken of them. Then there's Israel, who has always been a strong uh, opposition to the talks between Iran and U.S. the way it, it is being uh, going on right now. Uh, so what impact do you think a final Washington-Tehran deal will have on uh, the relation of United States with its allies across the region? Do you think at some point even United States might need to reconsider its uh, regional policies? I, I don't think so. Uh, I think our policies have been consistent, our friendships and our alliances have been consistent, uh, and they're important to all of us. Uh, in the aftermath of an agreement, uh, it'll be important for the United States to carefully explain the terms of the agreement and its implications to our allies, uh, beginning with Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, a good agreement, and clearly the United States uh, is only going to sign a good agreement from, from our standpoint, uh, is in the uh, interest of all the countries of the region and beyond. Um, and it's important to remember, um, at one point, uh, Israel and Iran uh, had very close relations uh, uh, with uh, an Israeli uh, office in Tehran. Uh, you know, there is nothing permanent in the current um, uh, pattern of alliances and enmities. Uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia had a very close relationship um, uh, in the late 60s and in the 70s. Uh, uh, you know, there is no reason with changes in policies uh, that uh, we could not return to such a period. So uh, first the agreement, then making sure everyone understands uh, why a good agreement is in the interest of all, and then we see what may be possible later. But as we're talking about this, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is lambasting the talks and uh, calling it from now a bad deal. So do you think United States would be it would be possible for the United States to convince 
uh, for instance, the current government of Israel or Saudis, that this is actually to their own benefit as well? Again, we have to see where we are in a week. Uh, if we get the agreement, it will be, by definition, a good agreement from uh, a United States perspective. Then I think it's just making that clear uh, to, to everyone in the region what it is, uh, why it is in the benefit of all uh, by ensuring security, stability, and Iran without nuclear weapons, and then going from there. Uh, uh, the Israeli government was in opposition to the uh, original interim agreement until they decided that it was actually pretty good. Uh, so let's see what we get uh, and then decide what we do with it. Uh, talking about the situation in the region, uh, there's no secret that it, it is in huge turmoil with ISIS raising the bar of the uh, shocking violence to a new level. Um, what, in your opinion, were the main factors that basically led to the current situation that we're seeing in Iraq and Syria? As you say, it's uh, a region in turmoil. It's hugely complex. In, um, in Syria, uh, I was an ambassador there. Uh, you know, I would go back to 1982 to, to find the source of the current crisis. Uh, February 1982, uh, the Assad regime isolated the Syrian Muslim Brothers in the city of Hama uh, and proceeded to use artillery and armor uh, to destroy the Brotherhood. They, they succeeded, but in the process they killed 15,000 or more uh, innocent, uh, mostly Sunni civilians. Uh, two things came out of that. Uh, first, a regime that knew there might be a day of reckoning. Uh, uh, and then spent the next three decades being sure that it was ready to confront whatever might happen uh, as a result of the Hama massacre. So Syria in March of 2011 wasn't like Egypt, it wasn't like Libya, it wasn't like Tunisia. The regime was ready. The other thing that came out of Hama is uh, the, the radicalization of Syrian Sunnis in the wake of that massacre. Uh, uh, so it was no particular surprise, I think, to many of us that the opposition uh, quickly assumed um, a radical Islamic coloration, Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, and then, as you say, the Islamic State. So this began decades ago inside of Syria, and it's important, uh, particularly for Americans who don't have a good grip of history, to understand that history counts. Uh, also explains why this is going to be very, very difficult to bring to any kind of solution. Uh, uh, in Iraq, the, uh, the legacy of the Saddam years, coupled by the, the shocks of 2003 and afterwards, have, have created a very disturbed political landscape in the country. And sadly, what we've seen in, in recent years is Iraqis, in the face of this chaos, reverting to basic identities uh, of tribe or of, of sect or, in the case of Kurds, of ethnicity. Um, and uh, the Islamic State has been able to take advantage of this, uh, now deeply rooted uh, inside Iraq, um, countered by sectarian militias backed by the Iranian government. Um, uh, so it is a very, very dangerous situation. As bad as things are now, they can get much worse inside Iraq. Okay, with the situation that you're mentioning, you're drawing, uh, how do you see the chances of countering ISIS? Um, first, we have to understand that this is fundamentally a political problem. Uh, it, in essence, it is not a military problem. Uh, uh, ISIS has found space uh, because of the failure of governance uh, the breakdown of a political order. So in Iraq, uh, I think it's urgent that steps be taken uh, uh, by the Iraqis with assistance uh, from the international community to start to repair some of these political divisions uh, in the country that separate Sunnis and Shia and Kurds 
in a very dramatic way right now to repair that damage. Because if they're able to do that, that takes space away from the Islamic State. That is how they're defeated, uh, by um, effective, inclusive governance and government. Uh, I think this is what uh, Prime Minister Abadi wants. Uh, he is going to need some help to get it from both inside the country and from without. And uh, how do you see the role that the United States is playing right now? If, if you compare the scale of attacks from the United States against ISIS with what we have seen in Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance, against Al-Qaeda and uh, Taliban, we can come to the conclusion that it's somehow low-key. Why do you think is that? Well, again, I, what I would like to see the United States do more of uh, is a political effort. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see higher level and sustained U.S. political engagement uh, with the Iraqi government, with political figures in Iraq that are outside of government, uh, to help them develop solutions to their political difficulties and their political tensions. I think that is far more important uh, in, in defeating ISIS, ultimately, uh, than a series of airstrikes. Uh, because what we are seeing, it's now been a year since ISIS rolled through Iraq. They may have been damaged in, in some respects, um, but they are not losing. Uh, and, and frankly, I am not sure at all that they can be defeated militarily. They have to be defeated politically, and I think the United States, working with the Iraqis, can play a very important role in that. We should do it. Uh, how about Iran? Uh, what role do you think Iran, and in particular, well, uh, both politically and militarily, what role can Iran play in Iraq's current situation? And more particularly, what role the God's force of IRGC is currently playing in political and military atmosphere of Iraq? In the beginning of our conversation, I, I mentioned some of the huge problems beyond the nuclear issue that divide our countries, uh, Iran and the United States. Uh, Iraq is one of them. <clears throat> I think right now, uh, <clears throat> Iranian policy in Iraq has been uh, uh, very damaging, and particularly the role of the Quds Force, uh, both directly, when we saw the Quds Force commander uh, up in Tikrit in front of the television command, uh, uh, the television cameras, you know, this is a, the Sunni heartland, if you will, and there is the commander of the Iranian Quds Force uh, for the world to see. Uh, we see uh, uh, Shia militias backed by the Quds Force now in the vicinity of Ramadi, the capital of Anbar, a Sunni province. Uh, it, it seems to me that the Quds Force, at least, is, is pursuing a policy that is aimed at the permanent division of Iraq into uh, a Sunni area, a Shia area, and a Kurdish area. Um, I, I and why think, would, would that be? Uh, I think for some, like the commander of the Quds Force, veterans of the Iran-Iraq war who, who felt cheated in 1988 that they had to settle for a truce instead of outright victory, uh, that that war is still going on. And this is the chance to obtain that ultimate victory that eluded them back in 1988. Uh, permanent victory it would be the permanent division of Iraq. Never again could a completely divided Iraq threaten Iran uh, as it did when it invaded in 1980. Um, that's the only explanation I can find to explain what the Quds Force is doing, both directly and through Shia militias in Sunni areas. Um, I don't think that is in Iran's long-term interest, uh, because uh, an Iraq divided along ethnic and sectarian lines, I, I think, poses a threat to Iran's own internal security over the long run, uh, uh, as it does for Turkey, for example. An independent Kurdish entity uh, in Iraq is going to have implications for Kurdish communities in Iran and in Turkey. So. I, what I think I'm seeing is the Quds Force pursuing a policy in Iraq uh, that is uh, completely destructive to the Iraqi state and regional stability, but also a policy that ultimately is going to be harmful to Iran. 
And as last question, there's this general assumption that since the Quds force is fighting uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and United States is uh, having its own fight with the ISIS, this, these two parallel fights might lead into a closing of the gap between Iran and United States. Uh, how realistic do you think that I, is? I take a completely opposite point of view. Uh, it is not uh, by any means always true that my uh, enemy's enemy is my friend. Uh, uh, I think Iran, the uh, Iranian government, the Quds Force, is using the Islamic State uh, to achieve the uh, policy outcome that I just described, the division of Iraq. I don't think uh, the Iranian government feels particularly threatened by the Islamic State. The Islamic State has not spoken uh, of any intention to, to occupy Tehran. Uh, uh, that's not on their agenda. So, But they have a strong opposition uh, towards the Shiites, and Iran is the main prominent Shiite power in the region. Uh, indeed, uh, the uh, Islamic State is a horrific organization. Its, uh, its, its sectarian murders are, are unbelievable, uh, whether against Shia, against Christians, as we saw in, uh, in Libya. Uh, uh, but I don't think their ambitions are in the Arab world. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, they're going to use their resources and manpower to, to try to pick a fight uh, with Iran that they know they can't win. Uh, they're going to concentrate on Arab objectives. Uh, Saudi Arabia is much more important to the Islamic State than Iran is. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for yours. Thanks.